Hi folks, my name is Derek Olson. I am a biblical scholar with a love for the liturgy. And today I'm going to be presenting to you a class that I presented at St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church here in Baltimore, uh, looking at the Trinity. So I was going to do the really quick version, uh, except they wanted me to talk for between 45 minutes to an hour. So this became the kind of quick version because this can be taught as a semester-long course or something. Um, we didn't have that kind of time or, or, frankly, the interest to try and do that. So this is just ending up to be the, the kind of quick version of it. All right, what I'm going to try and do is, is cover two topics. First, what good Trinitarian theology looks like and why it matters. Second, a quick overview of the history of the idea of the Trinity. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with one fundamental premise that has a couple of important corollaries that will lead to a spoiler. So, here's the fundamental premise. Trinitarian theology begins and ends with Christian experience. So, it begins and ends with Christian experience. The first corollary is the notion that the Trinity was discovered, not invented. Uh, th that's an important distinction. Uh, if, if you were to kind of go along with the, the Dan Brown school of uh, Christian history, it, you might believe that the Trinity was something invented by Constantine uh, in, in the year 325. Well, no, actually, that's not the case. Because, if, if you want to know how we know this, if a bunch of people had sat down in a room and thought it up, it would make a hell of a lot more sense than it does. Okay? So, this is something that was discovered, not something that was invented because it goes back to Christian experience. That's, that's our starting place. Now, what we do in Christian and Trinitarian theology is, is corollary two. What we're trying to do is to, it's all Trinitarian theology consists of attempts to wrap human language and human concepts around the Christian experience of God. So it's, it's putting our thoughts, our ideas, our language around that which we are experiencing together. The third corollary is that good and bad Trinitarian and Christological theology is determined by how well it conforms to and connects with Christian experience. Uh, if, if it doesn't have any connection to what we're doing and how we're living, uh, then it becomes less useful and uh, we start moving in, into the bad territory. Fourth cor corollary is that Trinitarian theology has developed over time not because of alteration. So it, it hasn't, it's not because we're changing our mind about what it is that we're experiencing, but because we've had to sharpen the precision of our language. Because this is the living community's attempt to wrap language around experience, the language has matured over time as new situations challenged our expression of that language. So the spoiler, the doctrine of the Trinity wasn't just thought up by a bunch of old white men in a room somewhere at some late date. Instead, it's been part of Christianity since the start, because Trinit Trinitarian theology is about trying to explain important points of Christian experience. So, um, when we want to start thinking about this and thinking about theology, how do we go about doing that? Well. As far as I'm concerned, the, the best place to start in thinking theologically is, is to go back to something that Bishop Lance of Light Andrews said. He speaks about one canon reduced to writing by God himself, two testaments, three creeds, four general councils, five centuries, and the series of fathers in that period, the centuries that is before Constantine and two after, determine the boundary of our faith. So, uh, we're going to be talking about all five of these things. However, we're going to focus in on that three creeds piece. Um, we're going to talk about that more substantively in the second half. Uh, the point I want to make at this point in time, though, is we have to talk about all five of these because the councils defined the language that was figured out by the fathers that was then summarized in the creeds in order to explain the experiences described and sought out in the testaments of the canon. So while we will be focusing in on the three creeds, um, all five of these are really going to be in play, and, and we'll talk about that as, as we go along. All right, now we're going to move into the portion of the program that I like to call Revelations of Divine Algebra. 
or also known as, uh, when I teach you everything that you need to know about Christological and Trinitarian heresies but have been afraid to ask in 15 minutes or less. All right, now, um, when I was a senior in high school, I had calculus class at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that, that, that didn't go very well for me. Uh, there is, however, one morning that I recall quite vividly. And this one particular morning, uh, the teacher said, okay, uh, take out your pencils. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to draw me a triangle with three right angles. And, and so I started by, by drawing one right angle and, and then another one. And, and, and then I realized that I was going to have kind of a problem because they were going up straight. I was, I was starting to make a square and, and the, the lines weren't going to connect up to make a triangle the way they were supposed to. And, and so the, the class on a whole just kind of, uh, yeah, we can't do this. This doesn't work. Well, the teacher took out a ball that she had had behind her desk and took out a marker. And, and starting at the, the North Pole, she drew a right angle and then went down to the equator and then drew a right angle there and, and, and went across the equator until she ran into her other line and drew up. And, and there, sure enough, on the ball, was a triangle that had three right angles. So the, the point of her exercise is, is she, she was trying to move us into a new unit where we were going to learn about non-planar geometry, the, the fact that geometry is different if you're doing it on curved surfaces and such than if you're doing it on a flat sheet of paper. <clears throat> what I took away from that class was uh, something a little different. <laughs> so I took away the idea that um, when you have a problem with an equation, you've got two options. The first option is that you can alter the equation, right? So, so you can try and fix the equation. The other option is you can change the rules. So you change the rules uh, under which the equation is functioning. Let me give you an example. So here we have a problem. 9 plus 8 equals 11. All right, th this doesn't work. Uh, try it on your fingers, you're going to have problems. So we have two options. The first option is to fix the equation. Uh, so no longer 9 plus 8, but we do 9 plus 2 equals 11. All right, so that, that's one option. Next option is to use hexadecimal. Uh, and then 9 plus 8 becomes 11. Uh, because 11 isn't 10 plus 1, it's 16 plus 1. So instead of changing the, uh, the equation, we're changing the rules under which the equation is functioning. Uh, now, why does this matter and why are we talking about this now? Because the way that the church fathers talked about uh, the Trinity, they essentially come up with a couple of equations. There's a Godhead equation and then there's a Christology equation. All right, so our first fundamental equation, the Godhead equation, is 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit equal 1 God. And then we have our Christology equation, which is 100% divine and 100% human equals 100% Jesus. All right, so we look at these and we say, well, the, the equations don't work under the rules that we're used to working under. What orthodoxy has always argued is that divinity works by its own set of rules that are different from, from the human ones. As a result, most of the many of the, the Trinitarian and Christological heresies that have popped up over the centuries are because people have been trying to fix the equations. They've been trying to correct the equations back to something which looks more normal to them, instead of realizing that we're dealing with a fundamentally different set of underlying rules. So, um, Heresy. It's bad. Why is heresy bad? Is it just because you're thinking something that some old guy has told you not to think? Well, no, actually. Um, the reason why heresy is bad for the most part is because it doesn't live well. Heresy is bad because something about it misconstrues the relationship between God and humanity or with humanity amongst itself. So it makes us live together wrongly. And that's why heresy is a problem. It's the lived implications of its logical conclusions. Now, heresy isn't often taught like that. 
And so it can seem like an arbitrary set of teachings that have been handed down somebody that you're supposed to believe or not believe. Um, in fact, we have to make those connections to say, all right, this is why this isn't a good idea. This is, this is how it can cause us to, to misconstrue these relationships. So I'm going to try and do that a little bit as we talk about some of the, uh, some of the ways that people have mistakenly attempted to fix some of these equations. So if we look at the, the Godhead fixes, um, the first one up here is 1 plus 0 plus 0 equals 1. So here they're saying that the Father is God, uh, but not Jesus and not the Son, not the Spirit. So folks like the Arians, the Photinians, the Ebionites tended to believe these sorts of things. Uh, th this is actually one of the most enduring heresies. So it has its classical formations. So the classical Arians would say things like, uh, Jesus was the first of all creations, uh, the first and best of God's creations, but a creation. So one of the things that, that we Christians fundamentally believe is that there's a difference and a distinction between God and creation. That these are two separate things. The question is, where do you draw the line? So if you have God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and creation, where do you draw the line of what's created and what's not? Do you draw the line um, under Jesus and the Holy Spirit or above Jesus and the Holy Spirit? And the Arians said, no, you have to draw it above. Jesus is the first and greatest of God's creation, but a creation nonetheless. Uh, whereas Orthodoxy said, no, no, you have to draw the line under. Uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are God and, and not creation. Uh, the simpler form of, of Arianism is, is the variety that you hear more commonly today, which is yeah, Jesus was a really nice guy and a really good teacher, but we don't really think he was divine. All right, what's the problem with this particular heresy? The problem with this is that God has to imagine. God's got to have a good imagination because if there's if Jesus is not God, then God doesn't know what it's like to be one of us. God's got to imagine what it would be like. What Christian orthodoxy teaches is no, God knows exactly what it's like to be one of us because Jesus was one of us. And Jesus suffered some of the uh, the worst experiences that humans can experience, being betrayed by his closest friends, being uh, arrested for a crime that he didn't commit, being put to death by government uh, that honestly didn't care. Um, so our fundamental teaching is, is that yes, Jesus is God because God doesn't have to imagine what it's like to be one of us. God knows what it's like to be one of us. All right, another fix is to say zero plus one plus zero equals one. Uh, so Jesus is God, but not the Father and not the Spirit. Uh, so we get this from some Marcionites, uh, the Marcionites and, and some Gnostics. Um, so what they were arguing here, um, th this is a view that's, that's based very strongly in Neoplatonism, which was uh, a philosophical system that, that was fairly rampant in, in the first several centuries. And what it did was draw a stark distinction between spirit and matter. And as far as they were concerned, there was no reason for uh, a good spiritual God to get mixed up in matter because matter is, is corruptible, uh, it decays, it's imperfect, necessarily so. Um, and so there was no reason why something that is spirit uh, would want to get tangled up in that. So if you've got a God who creates, that can't be a good God, especially if that God is putting spirit into things made out of flesh. And so as a result, they'd say, well, no, that, that can't be a good God. So this can't actually be a God. Uh, and so Jesus is instead trying to free us from this. Um, Christian Orthodoxy said, no, that, that doesn't work. Uh, creation, materiality, incarnation uh, is not some prison uh, that we need to escape. I instead, we rejoice in, in creation. We'll talk about this a little later when we get to Christology, because this same same sort of uh, logic will pop up there as well. All right, what's another fix? Okay, here we have 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. So the, these are tritheists and also some Marcionites. What's the problem here? 
Well, the problem here is that there's a failure to grasp an interconnection and to start seeing the, the three persons as being three separate distinct entities. Uh, in modern parlance, we kind of see something like this when people start making contrast between the mean God of the Old Testament and the nice, friendly God of the New Testament. Uh, they're either doing some form of Marcionism or they're doing a tritheism kind of thing where uh, we have the mean judgy God of the Old Testament and, and we try and avoid him and, and instead um, cuddle up with the nice Jesus of the New Testament. All right, we're going to do one more here uh, for the Godhead fixes. Uh, this is where we have one, then one, then one equals one. Uh, so this uh, can connect up with Patropassianus, with Modalus, perhaps with Montanus, with Franciscan enthusiasts. Uh, the, the last one is, is sort of an interesting form of this. Um, this was a, a heresy that popped up in the, the Middle Ages, um, and they were making the argument that there was a period of God the Father. And, and so they said that the period from the, in, recorded in the Old Testament, that's the period of God the Father. And then we had the period of God the Son. And so that's well, when Jesus comes, and, and so it starts with Jesus, and then it goes through the church uh, for a while until we get the age of the Holy Spirit, which was uh, inaugurated by St. Francis. And so St. Francis is now bringing in the age of the Spirit. And uh, that that's not really the correct way to think about that. Um, modalism is, is the most common form of this and, and the most commonly encountered today. That This is the notion that there is one God um, with three modes of action. So three things that, that it's doing, one God with three roles. And so we call the, the one God by different names based on whatever role it is that the God is currently doing. To talk best about one of the modern versions of this, we need to define some terms. So when we're talking about the Trinity, uh, one way to talk about the Trinity is to refer to what we call the imminent Trinity. This is who God is. Uh, and when we talk about the imminent Trinity, we use the language of persons. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, there's another way to talk about the Trinity, which shows up sometimes, and that's the economic Trinity. This is, this is not looking from the perspective of who God is, but instead at what God does. And so this is broken down in terms of, of three major actions, creator, redeemer, and sustainer or sanctifier. All right. Um, the problem here is when we start to make a, a direct equation between these two. Uh, when we say, oh, okay, uh, the, the Father is the Creator, the Son is the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit then is the Sustainer or Sanctifier. Um, again, it, it's a fairly easy move to make. Um, the, the first line of the Creed could even lead you into this, this sort of direction. Um, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Right. But that's not what Orthodox theology teaches about the relationship between the Immanent Trinity and the Economic Trinity. All right, it's easy to make equations with them right down the line, but we can't do that, and we shouldn't do that. The reason it's wrong is because according to Scripture and according to our doctrine, all three persons are at work in all three activities. The three main actions of the economic trinity are done by all three persons of the imminent trinity. Uh, to make an equation of that sort either falls into modalism, so one God with three jobs, and we call him different names based on what job he's doing, or tritheism, that there are three different gods with three different jobs. Instead, we need to think about the ways that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are creator, the way that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are redeemer. Right? A classic example here is uh, the Exodus event. We read about in the Easter Vigil and such, where we talk about God redeeming Israel, saving Israel from Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Right? That's a classic image of God the Father as Redeemer. Um, one of the fixes here, as far as I'm concerned, is to look at more medieval art. Here's an example. This is, in fact, uh, we've got two images here. Uh, we have Christ as Creator, and we have the Holy Spirit as Creator. So in, in the first, we have, we have Christ drawing a circle on the face of the deep, um, the connection there with wisdom and Proverbs 8. 
Um, in the other picture, we have the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters. So bringing forth creation out of the, the watery void at the beginning. All right, moving on to the Christology equation and the attempts to fix this. Uh, the first one is to say that 100% that human plus 0% divine equals 100% Jesus. And so Arians and Photinians and Ebionites were the, the sorts of folks who believed this, just like the 1 plus 0 plus 0. Um, so again, asserting that Jesus is a creature and thus a really, really special creation, but not God. Our second is the reverse of that. Uh, so that 0% human plus 100% divine equals 100% Jesus. So this was held by the Docetists, the Gnostics, the Marcionites. And again, these were folks who were influenced by this Neoplatonic paradigm that said that a, there's no reason why a spirit god would get itself involved with material matter and flesh. Um, so it would be beneath a true spirit god to take on matter. And thus Jesus only seemed to be human. That's where we get the name Docetist from. It comes from the Greek word dokeo, thus naming the heresy. Now, this heresy will pop up in popular religion whenever piety recoils at the notion of a material Jesus uh, that has material Jesus kind of problems. Um, so, anyone who has a hard time with a Jesus who sweated, who got stinky, uh, who got tired and needed to sit down and have a drink, or, hold on to yourself, a Jesus who had to go to the bathroom, if you've got problems with that, you may be holding some docetist views. Um, we tend to get into trouble and, and the docetists were getting themselves into trouble because they were trying to be overly protective of the dignity of God, right? That they wanted to save, preserve the dignity of God from what they thought was unfitting. Um, now the, the good news here is that God can take care of God's dignity all by himself, uh, without needing help from us on that account. Uh, so uh, most Gnostic groups had a docetic understanding of Jesus, as did Marcion. Um, technically speaking, a lot of these groups held that all humanity fell into the same general category as Jesus, uh, that, that there was a divine spark uh, that was imprisoned and captured in, in materiality. So um, uh, essentially the, the cosmology of, of a movie like The Matrix is essentially Gnostic. Uh, the idea that, that the mind part of humanity is trapped in, in some sort of prison world uh, that it has to be freed from by a redeemed redeemer. All right, moving right along, we have the 100% human, then 100% divine equals 100% Jesus. Uh, we get this from adoptionists, largely. Um, so one of the ways to read uh, the baptism account is, is to suggest that that was the point at which the Holy Spirit descended and the human Jesus suddenly became the divine Jesus. That at that point he was adopted by God when God said, this, you are my beloved son, you know, with you I'm well pleased. And, and so poof, at that point he becomes divine. Well, orthodoxy doesn't believe that. Um, some, some of those groups saw that as an ontological change, so something about his very being was changed. Uh, other groups saw this as sort of a legal fiction model. Uh, that Jesus was still human, but God said that he would pretend that Jesus was divine. Uh, I'm not really sure how that was supposed to work. All right, then we have the 50-50 model. So 50% human and 50% divine equals 100% Jesus. Uh, the Apollinarians in particular, I, I like to refer to them as zombie Christology, uh, because what they were teaching is that Jesus had a human body, but a divine spirit. So uh, essentially he was a, a human body that was possessed by the Holy Spirit. And so kind of the, the Holy Spirit was walking him around and such. Uh, another group that's, that came up with a model like this are the Monothelites. Um, these are folks who, who were condemned by the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And um, if you sort of hear an explanation of what the Monothelites believed... Um, it makes it sound like one of these sort of abstruse theological conversations and arguments that nobody really cares about uh, because the, the discussion was whether there was one will in Jesus or whether there were two wills. And so if there's a single divine will, then then that's that's what there had to be. Uh, Orthodoxy said, no, no, that there had to be two wills operative in Christ. All right. Why does that matter? Why does anybody care about that? The reason why we care 
is because the question that's really being asked is, is it possible for a human will that's not corrupted by sin, is, is it possible for a perfect human will to actually know and desire and will the good? So it's really, it's, it's less an argument about numbers of wills than it is an argument or a question about how good is creation? How were we originally created? And if we're in a state that we're not being affected by sin, can we actually do the right thing? Or is that part of our human limitation? So the Monothelites argued that we really couldn't do it, that there had to be a divine will operative or else Jesus couldn't have been obedient. Orthodoxy said, no, that's not actually how it works. We do believe that we were created good. We, we, do the, we believe that we really were created in the image of God. And so as a result, a human, a human will that hasn't been uh, touched by sin actually really can will and do the good. So this isn't actually as, as abstruse of a theological argument as it may appear at first blush. It really has something to do with who we are and how we can be. Um, let's take a look at one more here. Um, and this is the Nestorians. All right, so this is 100% human plus 100% divine equals 200% Jesus. Uh, so th they actually made the argument that, that there are two Jesuses. We have the, the cosmic Christ, and then we have the, the human Jesus. And that these are only sort of vaguely related to one another. We actually see this pop up whenever... Um, in, in academic circles, too hard of a distinction is made between the uh, Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, I think. Um, so, what's the problem with this particular perspective? The problem is that there's no connection between the two. Um, so, the cosmic Christ uh, that Colossians says is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things were created and have their being. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So this cosmic Christ has no fundamental continuity with the man who spoke truth to power in Galilee and Jerusalem and was willing to lay down his life for his friends on account of a message of love. Orthodoxy says that these are not two different and distinct entities, but they're one. That the Jesus who lived and preached and died for us is also the cosmic organizing principle of the universe. That love, self-giving, self-pouring love really is at the center of all things. So that's why this one doesn't work. All right, so that's that, that's kind of the, the quick version of, of um, Trinitarian and Christological heresies and, and how to think them through. Uh, I'm, I'm sure not all of them fall into this model, uh, but generally following this model, you get a bunch of them. So the, the key takeaway for me, at least, is uh, whenever we try to fix the equation, we get into issues. Instead, we should realize that we're dealing with an entirely different set of rules. All right. Uh, so let's head back to uh, Lancelot Andrews' dictum, and then let's dive a little bit into the creeds and, and look at the, the history of this notion of the Trinity. All right, so Lancelot Andrews here mentions three creeds. Well, what does the prayer book have to say about these things? So if you turn to page 854 in your Book of Common Prayer, uh, you'll find the Catechism. And the catechism section here discusses the creeds explicitly. So, what are the creeds? The creeds are statements of our basic beliefs about God. Um, if it were up to me, I would nuance this just a little bit. Um, what the creeds are is, th these are the boundaries of the playing field, right? So, we have the canon, we've got the scriptures, but how do we read them? We need some, some sort of hermeneutical guidelines. And that's what the creeds do, is they offer us guidelines uh, so on certain contested issues, certain issues that the early church fought over, the creed kind of nails down a particular stance on certain issues. Um, so who is God? Well, God is the father of Jesus Christ and the cr creator of the world. 
All right? It, so if, if you believe he's some evil lesser God, then w you're not doing Christian interpretation. All right? uh, Jesus was, was born of the Virgin Mary. So th this is one of the, the fundamental things that, that we have to believe if we're going to be doing a Christian interpretation. Uh, you can play outside of these lines, but you can no longer play outside those lines and try to call it a Christian interpretation. If it's going to be Christian, it's, it's got to be within these creedal boundaries. All right, how many creeds does this church use in its worship? Well, the Episcopal Church uses two creeds in worship, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. What is the Apostles' Creed? The Apostles' Creed is the ancient creed of baptism. So this is the creed that we use in the daily office. So in daily morning and evening prayer, the Apostles' Creed is, is the one that gets repeated. What is the Nicene Creed? Well, the Nicene Creed is the creed of the universal church. This is the one that we use at the Eucharist. So on, on Sundays and feast days at Holy Communion, uh, you're going to hear the, the Nicene Creed. What is the Athanasian Creed? The Athanasian Creed is an ancient document proclaiming the nature of the Incarnation and of God as Trinity. All right, so Lancelot Andrews talked about three creeds. Um, here we have the three creeds, so the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. But note, the creeds that the Episcopal Church uses in its worship are just the first two. We use the Apostles' Creed, we use the Nicene Creed. The Athanasian Creed, so while it shows up in the English Books of Common Prayer, uh, when we put together our first American Book of Common Prayer, we didn't include the Athanasian Creed in it. Uh, the current prayer book does contain that creed, but it puts it as a historical document. So it's in the prayer book, but as a, as a reference material, rather than something that we pray together in worship. All right, then the last point. Is the Catechism then moves to what is the Trinity and defines the Trinity as one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the imminent Trinity. All right, so if we take a look at, the, at uh, some of the, the contents of the Athanasian Creed, um, the Athanasian Creed is, is full of, of very technical language. All right, um, this creed was not actually written by Bishop Athanasius. Uh, we'll get back to him in a moment. Um, the language that it uses, the kinds of concerns that, that it's dealing with, um, place this creed in either the 6th century or the 5th century in Gaul. Uh, it very well may have been written by Vincent of Laurent, uh, who was a, a, a Gaulish monk and abbot there. Um, one of his writings that uh, was found in the 19th century or so uh, called the Comminatory has several uh, sections that look really, really familiar, um, very much like the Athanasian Creed. And, and so either Vincent wrote it or whoever did write it knew Vincent's Comminatory. Um, so it uses a lot of this technical language of persons and substance and uncreatedness uh, and, and is very careful not to confuse them. Um, major takeaways here is, is that all three of these persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are, are separate and distinct. Um, they are equal in power. They're equal in value. They're equal in essence. Um, it, it, this can get a little complicated and a little confusing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the best way to sort of wrap your head around the Athanasian Creed is, is to use a visual aid. All right. This is what's referred to in Latin as the scutum fide, the field, shield of faith. Um, and it lays out in sort of a pictorial diagram what the Athanasian Creed is, is trying to get across. And that is that, that we have the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit equal in size and, and shape and everything in the diagram. Um, they're not one another. You shouldn't confuse them with one another. Uh, but the three of them together are God uh, and the same God. So th this is the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity. Um, so that, that all the persons are continually and eternally present and equal and distinct and are not each other, uh, but they're all part of one Godhead. Um, honestly, everybody is just happy if they can get through the Athanasian Creed in one piece and not get too terribly uh, tripped up over the wording of it. All right, but the Trinity wasn't invented with the writing of the Athanasian Creed. Uh, it was around much earlier than that. So let's turn now to the Nicene Creed.
Uh, when Christianity was finally legalized and bishops started looking around and, and talking with each other around the inhabited world, the, the oikumene there, um, they started realizing that some of them were believing different things about Jesus and his divinity, exactly. Uh, th now, th they weren't really asking uh, whether Jesus was divine. The question is how Jesus was divine. Uh, and, and so that's where we have the break in, in the Arian camp versus, versus the, the Orthodox camp. Now, Constantine wasn't real thrilled about this because one of the reasons why he legalized Christianity to begin with is because he saw the potential for Christianity as a unifying uh, factor for his empire. Uh, and so he wasn't terribly happy when he found out that Christianity might in fact be one of its causes for division. So he got the bishops together and he wanted them to make a decision, uh, come to, to some kind of uniform decision. Um, and he honestly didn't care which, which direction they went in. Uh, there's actually some evidence that suggests he might personally have sympathized with the Arian position, but that's not what the bishops decided with. Uh, so what they did is they started with a local baptismal creed, most likely one from the Caesarea area in, in modern day Syria. Uh, not necessarily though, it, it could have been some other local one, but they started with a local baptismal creed and then they added in some technical language to it. So th this is the precision. They, they wanted to, uh, to take the basic framework of the creed and then add some precision to it. So the creed was then modified at the Council of Nicaea in 325. As a result, we call it the Nicene Creed. Uh, but then uh, more discussions happened. Uh, there was a concern about whether the Holy Spirit was actually God in there as well. And, and, and so they had another council. And so the Nicene Creed was modified again at the Council of Constantinople in 381. And so technically we shouldn't call it the Nicene Creed. We should call it the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. Um, now at the, at the third ecumenical council, uh, they made some changes and, and tweaks. And so they enshrined them in a version of the 325 Creed. And, and so the question arose, well, did we really kind of officially modify it in 381 or not? So at the fourth ecumenical council, the one held in Chalcedon, they uh, readopted uh, this creed. So technically we shouldn't even call it the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. Uh, we should really call it the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Chalcedonian Creed. Uh, but that's entirely too long. So as a result, we simply refer to this as the Nicene Creed. Uh, this is actually where we get that uh, saying about it doesn't make an iota of difference uh, because it did. So at the, at the original Council of Nicaea in 325, the Arians were trying to make uh, an argument about whether um, Jesus was of a similar substance or of the same stop, substance with the Father. Um, and, and the difference is, is the Greek letter I, whether it's homoousius or homoeousius. Uh, the orthodox position, the one that won, uh, does not have the iota of difference. It's homoousius. All right, moving along, we have the Apostles' Creed. So uh, this was also a local baptismal creed. Uh, this happened to be the one for Rome. So this is why it's prevalent in the Western Church, it's because this was the local Roman creed that people use to get baptized with. Uh, we don't know exactly how old this one is. It most likely was not written by the apostles themselves. Uh, the earliest evidence that we have of it, um, we, we see bits and pieces of it popping up in the, the middle of the second century. Um, so it's at least that old. Because it's a local baptismal creed, it doesn't need and thus doesn't have the, the kind and level of technical tweaks that the Nicene Creed has. Uh, what it does have, though, is a, a very clearly Trinitarian structure, right? We, we have clear sections. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit. So in doing so, it sketches a straight line right back to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, which records the resurrected Jesus saying, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, um, at the end of the day, did any of this arguing about persons and substance and stuff make a bit of difference to anybody? Well, actually, yes, it did. The specific words that went into the creeds that were argued about by the councils 
flowed out of the pastoral care, the preaching, and the study of scripture done by the church fathers, the church mothers, and a whole bunch of church peoples whose names we will never know. This stuff matters because they, and we, aren't just engaging in idle speculation about God, we're thinking through what it means for us to be in relation to God, and again, to accurately describe Christian experience so that we can better live as Christians. And just a note about that caricature of that room full of white guys. When we look at the church fathers whose teachings are important, uh, most important for the, the formation of the doctrine of the Trinity as we have it today, uh, we've got the Cappadocians, uh, so two Gregories and a Basil, um, two, two brothers and, and, and a buddy from modern day Turkey. But the other key figures are Africans. Uh, we have Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria, the one the Athanasian Creed is named for, uh, was actually one of the big movers and shakers uh, in establishing the Orthodox position at the Council of Nicaea and beyond against the Arians. Uh, but we also have Tertullian, uh, who wrote some important stuff about the Trinity. Uh, he's the earliest example that we have of Latin theology. Uh, but the cradle of Latin theology is, is not Rome, as you might expect, but in fact, North Africa. Tertullian was writing in Carthage, um, and also the great St. Augustine, also from North Africa, whose book on the Trinity uh, became the, the standard defining text on the matter for the Western Church. So maybe not just a room full of white guys. Arguments about the nature of God and Jesus usually at the end of the day turn out to be arguments about us. If you follow the thread Arguments about Christology uh, usually end up being about anthropology. What are humans like in our very best form? Who is it that we can aspire to be as humans fully alive? So th think about that whole discussion about the monothelites. Uh, it, it's not really a technical discussion about how many wills can we stuff into one body, but instead the question is, what's a real human look like? Well, what's a, a perfectly created human look like and able to be? Because at the end of the day, the question is, who could I possibly be? In fact, some of our earliest Trinitarian discussions are about just that. St. Paul, the earliest Christian author that we can date, is doing just that in 1 Corinthians. Okay, so there's a very influential theory from the mid-1800s that held sway for about a hundred years that was based on the philosophy of Hegel that insisted that references in the New Testament writings to either a high Christology or to a Trinitarian theology had to be late. And so by late, it's, it's suggesting the end of the first century, beginning of the second century. Now, uh, fewer and fewer people believe in this theory these days. And one of the major problems with it is that it's based on a biased construal of the evidence. That uh, essentially it's lining up evidence um, in terms of how well it accords with the philosophical presuppositions rather than what the evidence itself is showing us. Because if we take a look at 1 Corinthians, right, th this is one of the earliest of the undisputed letters of Paul. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 is all about Trinitarian theology and practical application. Uh, now, in this section, he, this is part of an argument that he started in 1 Corinthians 5 uh, that moves into 6. He's arguing about sex because, hey, we're Christians. What else are we going to argue about? Uh, now, what's important for us in this discussion is the way that he frames the argument. Um, the way he begins is, just like any other good Episcopalian would do, he begins with the concept of baptism and with the Trinitarian formula of baptism. All right, so here's how he begins. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the Spirit of our God. And, and then he goes on for a while, and, and then he emphasizes, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And, and he goes on for a little bit more, and then he says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? Right. And, and and just to be precise here, um, one of the arguments that, that we had in our First Corinthian Ex-Jesus class at Emory, um, when we were translating this from the Greek, 
Uh, because we were at, at Emory, the question was, are these yous here? Should these be properly translated as y'all or as all y'all? Uh, because all of these yous here are, are in fact plural in the Greek. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the correct answer is that these are all y'all. Paul is talking to a bunch of people here. Uh, but what he's doing is he's arguing out of a Trinitarian baptismal formula, just like we saw at the end of Matthew and, and that same structure that we saw in the Apostles' Creed, in order to make a practical point about how the church behaves, because it is simultaneously the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the chil children of the God who raised Jesus from the dead. So, um, it, it comes down to the practicalities. The Trinity is important. Our, our doctrine of the Trinity is important because of how we incarnate it, because of how we live it out. So, there's more that we could talk about. We could take this in a, a whole bunch of, of other directions and, and talk about another number of other things. Uh, but this is where, where we're going to wrap up. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to end just by hitting that fundamental premise one more time, that Trinitarian theology begins and ends with Christian experience. Or, to make it a little bit more precise, Trinitarian theology is the ongoing attempt to wrap ever more relevant and precise words around the data of Christian experience. So, of course, at, at that point, we stopped and we took questions and uh, uh, went in some interesting directions from that point. Um, we can't really do that here in the same way, but uh, you can go down and leave a comment for me, uh, which I'll try and answer. Um, and as, as long as you're down there in that area, go ahead and click the like button and the subscribe button. And so you can see more videos like this when they come out.